Slack channel uh, with brevity, uh, there was uh, the Wall Street Journal article that you, that was from 2016, was it? Who, who, where did the, did you post the Wall Street Journal article? The entrepreneurial oh, porn yeah. article. Was that 2016 or is that, that was, recent? yeah, this last fall, yeah, yeah. So was that a It was one of their top a, three most trafficked pieces. So was that a, an actual uh, requested article or a letter to the editor? It was a commissioned essay, a which commissioned is rare essay. for the journal. <clears throat> and it was, I, I read it this morning, it was fascinating because we're doing an entrepreneurial uh, accelerator program and the article was about entrepreneurial porn, which you, and you might, you might actually, I won't steal your thunder, but it was, it was interesting about how uh, business people process the images of grand success, grand entrepreneurial success. So she may talk about that. We're especially grateful to Laura because she's going to stay with us for quite a while. She's got first uh, 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 the presentation and talking about personal branding and early stage venture branding and whatnot. Then we'll uh, break, we'll bring food in for lunch. And then she's going to have a, a lunchtime chat about uh, her new book that's coming out. She's about to go on a speaking tour. She has a speaker's bureau. That was you. two speaker's bureaus uh, 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 to promote her new book. And it's really a neat topic having to do with introversion, uh, the sort of the characteristics of an introvert, and how they can succeed in the rough and tumble world of business. Is that a fair That's uh, perfect. Thank uh, you. synopsis? So please welcome Maura Ahrens Mealy and uh, give her your undivided attention. And take good notes and remember to uh, write down your questions and, and uh, have it be really interactive. So thank you again. Thanks, Jason. All right. Hi, everyone. Hi. It's, it's really fun to be here. Uh, I graduated from Brown almost 20 years ago, which is scary. Um, and I just have to start by saying that my company is called Women Online, and my husband calls it badge.org. <laughs> because, because we only work with women, and everything about us is women, and so he, when he's feeling testy and playful, he calls it badge.org. So we're, we're big on, on the V word in my house. Um, anyway, it's, it's great to be here. And um, I'm going to talk today and, and hopefully be helpful to you guys as you're thinking about building out your online professional brand. I didn't have much time to scroll through your various websites. Um, and I was impressed with what I saw. So um, <clears throat> I don't know a ton about your work online as it is. And I hope that as we go through, we can do a couple of case studies and workshops. And if you guys have questions as I'm going, please just raise your hands, because this is really meant to be an interactive workshop. Um, and I'm just curious, before we dive in, how many of you have what you would consider a pretty robust online presence, either for your company or for you as a founder or thought leader? Two. OK, cool. A lot to work with. What have you got? So uh, we filed an intent to trademark. Um, and we've incorporated, so uh, we have a Facebook page, a LinkedIn, and we also have a website built with a modern web framework. Cool. And we just have a, a large social following. Nice. Yeah. Um, on which platforms? Um, Instagram primarily, uh, Facebook, Twitter. And why Instagram? What do you do? Uh, so we, our product uh, that we launched with was a camera backpack, so photographers, Instagram, made the most sense. Okay, so what's your name? Dylan. Dylan. So Dylan has hit on a really big point. Nothing I'm going to tell you today is rocket science, and you probably know it all anyway. It's just helpful to bring it up to the top. So you chose Instagram because your customers are on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You have a visual product. You have a product that lends itself towards being shown off visually. And Instagram is a visual medium, right? Yeah. If you were writing long form 5,000 word essays to promote your product on social media, it probably wouldn't make sense. Right? So part of it is really when you're starting out, thinking about what's practical, what's affordable, and what suits your audience, right? not rocket science. So we'll dive into that. Oops, sorry. Clicker. And, and this leads me to my first point. And, and I will say, just to, to echo what Jason said, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a small business owner. I've had my business for about six years. I've been working freelance for 11 years. And I'm a blogger. I'm an author. I'm 
a multimedia person, but I am an extreme introvert <laughs> and I am sort of lazy. Like I am not the person who's documenting every moment of my life or producing elaborate videos. I'm super, super practical about the media that I use in my daily life and the media that I share in order to build my brand. And I think that that is something really important. When I write about entrepreneurship porn, part of what I'm trying to talk about is the fact that you can be a successful entrepreneur and not you know, buy into the hype that every single moment of your life has to be curated for the internet or has to be documented. You know, I think that there is a way that you can build a professional brand that is useful to your audience, that helps you build credibility as a thought leader, but is not your 24 seven job and allows you to run your business. So just wanna let that framework go. Because ultimately, I mean, I think what's amazing about the internet is that it fulfills utilities in our life. I mean, I was thinking about, you know, three sort of entities online that I check and that I'm, you know, people that I feel attached to viscerally every day in a professional way. And there's Glenn Thrush from the New York Times. I'm a political junkie. So the reporters that I follow on Twitter and that I listen to on podcasts, I have a personal relationship with them and I check in with them every day, right? They are sort of integral to my experience as I go around the internet. The same for Rebecca Traster, who's a, a political journalist. She writes a lot about women's issues. There she is, is my favorite moment ever on MSNBC, nursing her newborn baby. So she's talking about politics and she's being herself and she's being authentic and she's making a statement and it's fantastic. And then there's pure utility. This is one of my favorite mom blogs. I have three little kids. I read labels for you. If I'm gonna go buy sunscreen, if I'm gonna buy a new snack for my kids and I wanna know what's in it, I can literally go to this blog and she's done all the research for me. So it fulfills a really fantastic utility in my life. And I think that that's really, really important <coughs> when you're thinking about starting your company, either as creating a sort of company or corporate presence, or even yourself as a business thought leader, right? Who am I trying to reach and what, what, what niche am I trying to fulfill? You'll hear the word niche a lot today. And the other thing <laughs> that I just want to say is um, nobody knows what they're doing, right? I think one of the biggest changes that I've seen in, in the time that I've been doing marketing online, so I got my first job on the internet in 1999 at iVillage.com, which is sadly no more, but was for many years the largest website for women. Um, and I still basically use the same sales pitch as I did in 1999. But what's happened is that back then, we used to go to destination websites, right? You would go to your Yahoo homepage or you would like click onto a URL and now we live in our feeds. And you all as digital natives, this is probably like totally duh to you. But for older people like me, it's been a significant change as marketers because we used to market towards a destination. I don't know if you guys remember the word portal. Um, and now we have to reach people in their feeds as they use the internet on mobile and throughout their daily life. And that's why fulfilling a utility and having a niche is even more important than ever. And um, this is a picture of actually, I don't know if you can see, it's a little blurry, the BBC's Instagram. And I was actually giving this talk, um, a version of it at Harvard a few months ago, and there was a reporter, a, an executive from the BBC in the room, and she goes, oh God, we had to try Instagram because we have to try everything. And I thought that that was a really important point, right? The BBC is one of the world's largest news and information organizations. They have to try every single media, right? As it comes out, they need to have a presence there because they are trying to reach everybody throughout the day. You, as a small business or an incubated startup or whatever you call yourself, do not have to try everything, right? You have to know what your audience wants and where they are. And so that's also really important to remember. If you're the BBC, you've gotta be everywhere. If you're a Procter & Gamble, if you're a giant company, you need to be everywhere. But if you're where you are, and frankly where I am, you don't. You just need to do some things really well. The other thing that I think is important as we think of ourselves as entrepreneurs is that in this day and age, it's really important to have a portable professional brand. And you could see this um, at the beginning with the reporters that I follow on Twitter. You know, years ago, you wouldn't really know most reporters' names, right? You would associate them with the institution that they were aligned with. You'd know Woodward and Bernstein, 
But normally you'd think, oh, it's the Washington Post, so I trust it, right? It's the New York Times, so I trust it. That's all changed. We're all on our own. You guys might be starting startups now. Who knows where you'll be in 10 years? But when you're building that profile online, that thing has to travel with you, right? That is your living CV. Everyone out there is a free agent for themselves online. <laughs> and that's why you see reporters building Twitter followers apart from their institution. You see CEOs. This is um, Sophia Amoruso, who founded a company called Nasty Gal. I don't know how many of you know her story. I think it's an insane story because her business totally failed, right? She over leveraged, she went bankrupt, but she built this incredible brand. She has a TV show, she's got a best selling book, she's got a podcast, right? So she was sort of like, okay, the business didn't work out so well, but I'm Sophia Amoruso. I've got my path. And she did that through building her brand on social media. Now you can see the downside to that, for example, you know, Travis. Kalanick today at Uber um, has had an extreme downfall from getting too far out there with his authentic self in the business realm. So it needs to be managed. But I do think that it's super strategic as you guys are starting out to think about, and Jason may kill me for saying this, not just about, you know, how can my startup be amazing online, but how can I as an emerging leader also make sure that I'm setting myself up for success and what could be a 60 year career, right? With an internet profile that follows me. And the other thing, I mean, it's not just crazy entrepreneurs who do this. This is um, Angela Ahrens, who's a senior executive at Apple. She runs all the Apple stores and she's an, an, an executive that I admire because she uses the internet in a really smart way, right? She's got a really fantastic Twitter, uh, Twitter feed that's really about her sort of being in the Apple retail world, it's super professional. She's not personal, she's completely professional, but it feels authentic. She writes on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is, is really interesting these days because it's trying to be a little bit of a Facebook for our professional lives. So she blogs on LinkedIn. And when you're a LinkedIn influencer and you can blog on this, you get just monster, monster traffic. So, you know, even you see not many corporate exec executives, frankly, but some who like it using and cultivating a really powerful personal brand online. Any questions? Do you think it starts more, like when we're a no-name startup, like nobody's heard of us, why do you, think it's, do you think it's important to still like start cultivating this personal online presence? And For sure. I mean, I think that, um, I do. <laughs> I think that um, for several reasons. I mean, you're here, right? You're obviously ambitious. You have big, big vision, right? And so obviously you want to share that vision and you want to share that vision where most people are, which is the internet, right? So in some ways it's, it's a no brainer. You know, you want to both, but you have to balance your vision for your startup with your vision for yourself as a leader and a thought leader, right? Um, and that's, that's a challenge that a lot of people struggle with and you guys probably aren't there yet because you're not into full blown companies, right? You don't, do any of you have like full blown companies with staff? Right, so you're not there yet. But for now, it's about creating that balance of this is my vision, this is my startup and I want people to see it so they get interested. So, you know, you're here today. Um, okay, so here's, here's my cautionary tale where I get cranky. Um, <laughs> Because there's been a ton of data, and I, I interviewed a really fantastic computer scientist for my book whose name is Cal Newport. He's at Georgetown, and um, he's a computer scientist. He loves technology, but he's done a lot of foundational research on the true addictiveness of social media. And I think it's probably no surprise to any of you here that a lot of these mega platforms that we are all addicted to are actually created to make us feel left out, right? They're created to make us feel like we're missing out, right? Fear of missing out, FOMO. I'm obsessed with FOMO because I think it's a real danger for an entrepreneur. And I think it's a real danger also when you're creating your online presence to both not feel FOMO, but also manipulate FOMO to grow your brand. Does that make sense, right? The best leaders and brands in our life make us feel like we wanna be with them, like we wanna be them. Like, oh my God, you're so amazing, I wanna be you. But it's also really dangerous when you are a leader to be susceptible to what your colleagues are doing and feel left out. And this is to me one of the biggest challenges that we're all dealing with as entrepreneurs in a digital world. 
a really stupid example, I don't know about you guys, I'll be like having a really good day, I'll be working and I'll check Facebook and then, you know, a colleague is like, oh, I'm off to TED or, oh, I've been honored, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I'm sitting here in my, my home office, like I'm not being honored, I'm not being invited, I'm not speaking at TED, right? And all of a sudden you're like, you're a six-year-old kid who's left out at the birthday party. <laughs> and so as you enter into the entrepreneurial ecosystem, you, I don't know if you guys, does this feel real to you? Do you ever feel this already? Yeah? Like, do you have an example? Or is it just, um, this really feel real? I would say um, just like very similar, like back when I was in Thailand, I just like go to like random event and one of my friends just uh, was invited to be a speaker mm -hmm. in like a entrepreneurship event. Yeah, and you're not, and you're like, what's what? <laughs> you know, and so, but when you are invited to be a speaker, you gotta let everyone know, because that's how you build FOMO, and that's how you gain investors, and that's how you gain traffic. It's this really interesting dance that we're all doing, and I think it's really important to be conscious of it, right? So as much as I say that you need to ban FOMO, from your life when you're building your online brand and when you're doing your day as an entrepreneur, you also need to think about how you're gonna cultivate other people's FOMO for how cool your product is and how cool um, everything that you're doing is. Because honestly, that's how you attract investment, that's how you attract media. I don't know if, and do any of you listen to the podcast Startup? Yeah, it's a great, it's a, such a good podcast. I really recommend it. Go back and listen to season one. Um, and, and one of the lessons, a guy comes from public radio and he's starting Gimlet Media, which is one of the first podcast startup. And so he takes you through his journey. And one of the things that is the biggest lesson for him is he, when he's out pitching venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, everyone is like, eh, you're too small. You know, he's not cult, you're not, you're not thinking big enough. You're not, you're not sexy enough. And he says, I'm not cultivating enough FOMO. Investors don't feel like if they don't invest in me, they're missing out because I'm just not sexy enough. I'm not thinking big enough. I'm not doing enough. And I think that that's a really important lesson, right? Is that part of succeeding in a really crowded landscape is cultivating that sense that like, oh my gosh, if you don't join me right now, whether it's following me on face or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, or it's investing in me, you're missing out. So I don't want to belabor this point too much, but I think it's really important. So. Given all that, how do you get started? And how do you get started in a manageable way when you don't have a ton of budget and you don't have a ton of staff and you have a lot of other things to do? Um, I have what I call the rule of three. This is a very simple heuristic. Um, own your niche, own your name, and own your look. And this is all about building your online professional brand. But the niche exercise you can take wider, and actually Jason referenced it even before when he was asking you guys about your foundational research and it was sort of your elevator pitch or your tagline for your company. That can be translated into your niche. And this is something that sounds so simple and we're gonna go through an exercise in a minute where we're gonna write down our niche. It sounds really simple, but it is very, very challenging. And I don't know if you've been through other workshops in the accelerator where you've thought about your brand and you've thought about your positioning. Have you guys? No? Okay, so that's good. So we'll do a little bit. We'll do some of that today in the internet context because, you know, again, when we're dealing with a, a world where you have someone's attention span for a second, you have to be very, very clear about what you stand for and who you're going after, right? So owning that is really important. Own your name. This is very basic, but really, really important. When you guys are thinking about how you're gonna grow from here, I want you all to leave here today and go buy all the domain names you need, reserve all the Twitter handles, Instagram handles, whatever you know platform you're gonna be on. This is really, really important, and you would not believe the giant corporate clients that I have who are like, oops, I forgot to buy the .com or the .org or the dot .whatever iteration of my brand name, right? Like, people make these mistakes and I don't want you guys to. It's really easy and it's a really smart investment. And then owning your look. And that's where we can talk about, you know, how are you, should you invest in a logo, photography, all that stuff. But I think I'm a big believer in having a visual presence as well, considering also where you're supposed to be. 
Um, and I'm just going to talk for just a tiny bit about my story. Um, so my company is called Women Online, aka Vag.org, and um, we are very, very focused. We um, create campaigns that mobilize women for good. We're a social impact agency. We work in the digital space, and we only work on campaigns and for clients who have women as the end audience. And um, you know, it's a very small business. There's 11 people, but we have the biggest clients in the world, literally. We work for the biggest bank, the biggest foundation, the United Nations, the world's largest trade, uh, world's largest trade association, world's largest union, President Obama, and Hillary Clinton. So we have like massive, massive clients. And um, all the years that I've owned the business, people have always sort of come up and patted me on the shoulder and said, oh, that's so nice. You market to women. That's so cute. Mostly men say that. <laughs> um, we have a special focus reaching moms, right? Because moms are really powerful consumers. Everyone wants to reach them. And people think that my business is like very, very sweet and niche because we only reach women and we have a very special focus. And for a while, I felt really bad about that. <laughs> I was like, I'm not thinking big enough. I'm not being broad enough, you know? Never mind the fact that women are 52% of the population and we vote more and we spend more money and we advocate and all that stuff. And we keep life going. Never mind that. Um, you know, people would sort of be like, oh, that's such a nice little business. And I would feel bad about it. And then I sort of came to the point where I was like, fuck it. I love this business and no one else is doing this. No, there's lots of marketing to women agencies, there's lots of social good agencies, there's lots of political digital consulting firms, but no one only focuses on mobilizing women for social good using the internet. Right? It's a small niche. I'm never going to be Google, <laughs> but it's been really great. And so I think part of, part of what my journey has been, and if you have giant dreams to go and take over the world, I think that's amazing. I don't have those dreams. I am super, super happy with my focused business. And I think that that's valid. And that's all I'll say about that. And then you can go conquer the world. Um, so women online. And the really cool thing, when we first started out, and you'd Google women online, and I would look at my Google Analytics and my inbound keywords, it was like, mail order brides, Russian brides. Uh, Russian and Ukrainian brides were the biggest inbound search terms that I had for years being called women online. <laughs> I guess men were like, I want women online. But as, as I existed longer, right, and built more legitimacy, now if you Google women online, you get my company, which is pretty cool. So we literally own the niche. Please don't anyone do it and prove me wrong, because then I'm going to look like an idiot. But when I did this, it was valid. I got started um, because I worked at iVillage. I worked in film after I graduated for Brown, then I worked for, for, for iVillage.com, and I started out doing public affairs and PR, and then I was sent to England, and they did a big merger with, with a Tesco, and I ran marketing, and I really loved doing digital marketing. It was so much fun. It was like the Wild West, but I had analytics, right? So I could try something, and then I could prove it. And um, it was amazing, and, I, and then I ended up working briefly in online travel, where I got really super quantitative and I got to figure out how to get people to book flights and use Google ads and all that kind of cool stuff. Um, but then I sort of had a quarter life crisis and I realized that politics was my first love. So I went to Washington and I got a job working for John, Kerry, John Kerry's presidential campaign doing online fundraising. So writing and sending a million online fundraising emails. And this was back in 2003 when this stuff was pretty new. I also had a lot of fun doing things like taking out Google AdWords <laughs> for voter registration. We registered 80,000 voters just by playing with AdWords. And back in the old days, you know, people didn't think like that. Now this stuff is old hat. Mom. <laughs> That's my mom. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, I became internet marketing director for the Democratic National Committee, and uh, this was the height of the 2004 election, and all these blogs started popping up. All these political blogs, particularly on the liberal side, on the progressive side, and they became incredibly powerful. All of a sudden, people just would create a website and publish thoughts, and it became incredibly influential in the political scene. And I just became obsessed with it. 
I just thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing, right? Like the fact that people couldn't just through a, using a quick site like TypePad or Blogger or WordPress, you know, publish their thoughts, cultivate an audience, and end up being influential in politics when so, so for so many years, money and all these big forces have kept normal people out. This is amazing. And so I became really obsessed with blogging. And then after the election, George W. Bush won, John Kerry lost, that was horrible. I went and I worked uh, at Edelman on K Street. It's the world's largest independent consulting firm, a communications firm, big PR marketing agency. And my job was to then take this blogging knowledge and this online persuasion knowledge and bring it to giant corporations. So one of my first clients was Walmart, and this was back in 2005. And as a committed liberal, I had a lot of issues with working with Walmart, but it was the most incredible learning experience because Walmart had a huge problem online, and they still do, and they haven't gotten better. But Walmart is one of those sort of hot button companies that we all love to hate on online, and it really makes their reputation, they really suffer, right? They have a reputational crisis because people write such bad stuff about them online, just to put it simply. I mean, they have a reputational crisis because they have bad labor practices and all that. I'm not going to get into that. But from a PR and marketing perspective, they have a problem because when you Google them or when you find them, it's like Walmart sucks. I hate Walmart. Walmart fired me. And so that was my job, right? How do I make the front line of Google better for Walmart? It's a kind of cool challenge. And it's something to think about also when you're thinking about your business, right? If you Google various keywords related to your business, competitors, et cetera, what do you find? And so one of the first things we did with Walmart was we started getting bloggers to publish positive blogs, right? When Hurricane Katrina hit, Walmart actually did an incredible job. Walmart was a hero. And I went in and I said, we got to start a blog live from New Orleans, right? And they did. And all of a sudden, that real-time content started indexing. And so when you started Googling Walmart, things got a little bit better. And that was really powerful for me because I could see how the message wars were being fought you know, in Google and in all the internet sites that we go to. And then I met um, a woman named Lisa Stone on a trip. <laughs> and she started this website called Blog Her, which was sort of the next generation iVillage. It's the largest community for women who blog. Again, it's been sold, and it's sort of no more. And I became um, one of their very first political bloggers. And so I all of a sudden had a big platform, and I started blogging, and I started sharing my thoughts. And that was amazing because that gave me a voice. And um, by 2008, I was sort of a pundit. This was actually a post that I wrote on Blog Her and it got syndicated on a bunch of sites and it was their top trafficked site in all of 2008. Um, which was amazing, right? Because little old me could have a huge voice. I started to go on TV and um, I got a lot of horrible things said about me, which is why I'm a little gun shy about social media even to this day, if you're going to be out there, especially as a woman, you have to be really careful. And this was before Twitter. This was before things got so horrible. But if I would be on television, the right-wing blogs would pick up my appearances, and people would just write the meanest and most hateful things about me. And so I share that, too, by saying you've got to have a tough skin. If you're going to get out there, especially as an entrepreneur, A, you have to have a tough skin because you're going to face rejection a lot. But B, if you're going to be out there in the digital universe, you have to have a tough skin. And so I started my business because I thought, oh my god, this is so powerful. And I was obsessed. I wasn't a mom at the time, but all these mom bloggers came up and they had massive traffic and massive influence. And I thought, I'm going to create a company where I'm going to work with all of these publishers. I'm going to work with all these mom bloggers, these content creators, and we are going to create campaigns for all the nonprofits and political campaigns and all the causes that I love. And that's how I started my business. And it was totally an accident. Um, and so this is just some examples of all the things that we do. Um, we do all kinds of fun things. We work a lot on Instagram. We work on Facebook. We create videos. Right now, we're working with Planned Parenthood a lot. We're trying to mobilize especially mom support against the American Health Care Act, as you may have heard of it. The Senate is sneaking it in for a vote. And um, you know we're just trying to get moms mobilized. So we have everyone from bloggers at BuzzFeed working for us. We have um, 
you know, everyday people using Facebook, creating t-shirts, doing everything, you know? And, and this is normal now. Like, I was amazed. I don't know how many of you are in Pantsuit Nation, you know, for Hillary and our political online, but the fact that we can use Facebook as an everyday organizing tool is so incredible to me. And that's a lot of the work that we do. And we've sent, you know, we've sent bloggers to Capitol Hill. We've sent them to the, to the that. We've sent them to the Today Show. We've sent them out canvassing for President Obama. And, you know, I've been sent to the White House as an envoy of what mom bloggers think. So it's been, it's been a great ride and I, and I share this with you only to say that I never meant to do this <laughs> and um, certainly never thought that I would be an entrepreneur um, and certainly not one who could like put stuff up on the internet and you know also manage to do some good for the world. So um, where you start out may not be where you end up but it's always good to think of the things that you love and pull those threads together. Okay. Any questions? We're going to get into the workshopping part. This is the first piece that I want to say is coming back to the, all the mean comments that people said to me. It's okay to be a professional leader online if you're allergic to social media. I do not have a giant following on Twitter. I'm not like a huge influencer. That's not been my path because I don't want that. It's too painful for me at least because I'm very political. And I think that's okay. You can still make your company really stand out. You can make yourself as a leader stand out. We're gonna talk about how. Because your personal brand is for your credibility. It's not just social. And this is really, really important, especially for those of us who are really into social media in our daily lives and our social lives. It's, you know, we think, oh my God, can I ever create a divide? How do I bridge the two? We're gonna talk about how to create a personal, sorry, a professional social brand because it really is your portable CV, right? It sticks with you through your whole life. Um, and I always say for me, you know, I'm 40 now and I've been doing this stuff for, you know, a long time, over 10 years, I've, you know, I've had three kids, I've left the workforce here and there for months at a time, I've hidden, I've stopped doing public speaking, but as long as I keep publishing online, nobody knows where I am, right? I'm still like a viable professional person, even though I may be nursing a newborn baby and not out there. And so this, you guys might be too young for this now, but if you start building a great reputation and a really good portable CV online, it's sort of like an annuity you can buy for your professional life in case you decide you wanna go hiking for a year or something. <laughs> um, it ensures a strong digital footprint. And if you love social media, if you want to merge your personal and your professional and you know, be one of those leaders, that's totally cool, but you don't have to. And I think it's also important to remember um, that in this day and age, you know, you have to be really conscious about what you post online. I'm not going to be one of those people, and I'm sure you've all been through those seminars, who's like, don't put anything, you know, you guys all got into college, so you've gotten through this, but, you know, we hear over and over, be careful what you put on the internet, otherwise you won't get into college and you won't get a job. You guys all know that. But I think also looking forward as a leader and as a professional person, you always need to remember that. You just always need to remember that. There is nothing private anymore. You know, when I was coming up in PR, they would always say, never put anything in writing you wouldn't want to see on the front page of the New York Times. And that is like doubly, triply true these days. So just remember that. Any question? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard the story where like some Harvard students were like exchanging racist content. Oh yeah, and they can't go next year? On a private message uh, group and then they lost their admission. Do you think that people should be like hyper cognizant of what they're saying now in like what they perceive as a private setting? Yes. Or do you think we should move to um, encrypted, like self disappearing messages, which I know like Facebook offers, for example, and just communicate through those? I don't know. I mean, look, I, I think it's also, you know, I have a lot of friends in politics who are totally off the mainstream internet now, you know, and I can only reach them through Signal. And, but, I mean, is that another false choice where we feel safe? I think that if you are getting ready to be a leader and you're going to say racist bullshit like that, A, you have no business being a leader, but B, you know, use your brain. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, you know, just use your brain. 
it's just that sometimes like people can be reactionary and take things out of context, right? I'm, I'm not saying like say Ab absolutely, um, absolutely, people like, can you be. You don't want like your personal things that you were saying to somebody in confidence just to be leaked all over the internet. So whether it's yeah, worth, like just not having those sort of conversations, um, even in what you perceive as a private setting. I think that Unless this. There's no written documentation. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious what you all think. I think that, A, look at Travis Kalanick. Like, he started one of the world's most valuable and disruptive companies, but because he was a jerk, basically, he's out. So if it can happen to him, A, although he wasn't, he didn't try to hide it. He was public about it. Um, and then the, the other thing is just, I mean, I, I'm sort of, you know, my husband is, my husband is like a, he's like a survivalist libertarian catastrophist who just thinks the state is everywhere and, you know, I'm not quite that bad, but, um, <laughs> Why, I just, I don't know. I, I think that it's, I think that you see the real downsides of it. You know, in politics, it's unfortunate because people, leaders can't say anything anymore because they're constantly being spied. They have trackers who come and film them. But I think it's better safe than sorry, honestly. And, 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 and I just wouldn't put anything on the internet or on digital that you would never, I just wouldn't, especially if you want to be a high profile leader. Uh, tied to this topic, um, have you ever posted content that you thought was a mistake or consulted someone um, that has? And have you ever had to deal with like this damage control sort of? Um, a few times. <laughs> and I mean, luckily, touch, oh God, I, every day I wait for it though. Mm -hmm. Every day I wait for it. And I think that that's another, um, another piece of it, you know? Um, I think part of it, though, is, is, is believing in what you say and knowing that people are going to attack you anyway, you know? Um, but I, I have a motto, which my mom's going to laugh, always consult before doing. This is, this is something I learned when I was in graduate school at Harvard. Um, there's a famous professor at the law school, um, Dan Shapiro, who's a negotiation expert, and one of his tenets is, always consult before doing. And so I think that that is a really good thing to think about also as you're beginning to create content is maybe you have a buddy. You know, maybe you have a buddy who you can like bounce ideas off of. Um, you know, if you say something stupid on the internet, most people get over it. If you write something wrong, you know, people are, people are okay. It's, you, you can't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, but I think it's also good to have a buddy and sort of ask people, sure. Hi. Um, how do you create a social media brand voice? Brand voice? We'll get there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going too slow for you. Um, where were we? Okay. So just real quick. So I like to think of I like to think of social media, and this is actually more from a from a company perspective. You can think of it as your PR. Like you guys aren't going to be investing right now in PR firms, right? But if you have a good handle on your social media presence and your digital content, it should do PR for you. And I think that that's really important. If anyone doesn't believe that PR is important, look at Donald Trump. That man spent no money on advertising. He had no operation. And basically, it was free media coverage that won him the presidency. And this is hugely documented. I am a huge, huge believer in media and narrative. And largely, one of the ways that you get that narrative is you help create it through social media. You help create the FOMO, <laughs> right? We live in a world where we are, where entrepreneurs are speaking and they're tweeting and they're opining and then Fast Company picks it up and then they're invited to speak and then their video goes viral. That is all about having a smart personal narrative and getting it out there. So I can't underscore enough, and this is to your point about how to build a brand voice. You know, like, we'll talk about building the voice in a sec, but you have to know that you want to build one, because it's really, really important, especially when you're just starting out. Narrative is everything. And then the other thing that's really, really big, and that, I mean, that shapes, it's MSM is mainstream media. You know, when you're an entrepreneur and you're looking to get coverage, writing smart things on the internet is an amazing way to start. Um, the other thing is, is the long tail, right? Is being findable. Like come back to the Walmart example. You wanna be findable when people are looking for something specific to what you do. And that's why it's really amazing and you can be super, super niche and people will still find you when they wanna find you. Like Diva Cup, right? <laughs> like how do you, when you're building your company, if you're competing with Diva Cup, understand 
who looks for Diva Cup on the internet, where they are, what AdWords they're buying, and how can you insert yourself into that conversation. Okay, so we'll start with the brand voice piece. And this is, this is really basic, but it really works, I promise. This is an ecosystem. I found this on the, you know, Google Images, so forgive me, but it's a wetlands. <laughs> um, I am huge on thinking about what your ecosystem is as a company. So does anybody want to throw out their company to me and we can workshop it? You've talked too much. <laughs> uh, we're Pangea. Mm -hmm. We're creating a platform that gives individuals the tools to start their own businesses and connect with their local communities. Cool. So what is that? What is that? Give me an example. So if I'm a small business owner. Okay. Uh, so more for individuals. So okay. Students at the onset. So a Johnson Wales student who is a culinary student uh, providing their cooking services to someone at Brown. Sweet. Okay, great. That's a great ecosystem. So off the top of your head, who is, um, what's the <coughs> digital universe or the path of the person who that Johnson & Wales student might be trying to reach? Um, currently, uh, they're probably on Facebook, mm -hmm. probably on Instagram, and we're developing an application that they would create a profile on and then discover all the tools for the application. And then you can also see the other individual's presence in other social media channels as well. Right. So it's a cohesive, so you as Pangea, your ecosystem is college students online, and then meal service providers. Who else? Who else? Who else might that student at Brown be consulting when they look for you? Or are they just going to be in their social network anyway, and they might come across you accidentally? Like I'm, if I'm looking for someone to cater my dinner party, is that where I'm going to find the Johnson and Wales student? Sure, you can search for something specific. Wow. It's a combination. Okay. So, so it sounds like your ecosystem is actually, from a consumer perspective, reaching your audience, the internet sites that we go to the most. Right? That's, that's hard. <laughs> I think you might have to get a little bit more narrow. How are you doing it in your pilots? Um, right, I mean, right now, we've got an Instagram, mm -hmm. just showing the behind the scenes of what we're doing. We've been engagement on it. It's very small. We have 170 followers. I'd like 50% engagement every post. That's great. Um, and we're just trying to keep people abreast. Mm -hmm. so we're still working on, uh, but right now we're, we're pushing out content just to kind of keep people involved and excited about what we're doing. It's funny because when I on my Snapchat I have my phone before, like it's like taken up by all these new grads who are all like spelunking around uh, Southeast Asia right now. Everyone's riding elephants. It's the weirdest thing. Um, and I have them now hitting me up because I'm posting pictures of like me sitting in the next room, like wearing whiteboards, <laughs> and they're all getting super excited about that. And I'm actually doing reverse FOMO. Because you want to be riding elephants, not no, sitting. No, they want to be. No, I get it. I get it. Oh, you're oh, you're creating FOMO. That's excellent. You would think that I'd have FOMO of riding elephants. But you don't want to be riding elephants. You want to be in here. Yeah. Good. Okay. That's cool. So, so your ecosystem, from a consumer perspective, is challenging, right? Because you're trying to reach potential customers in their sort of daily lives as consumers on the internet. So Craigslist is a big piece of your ecosystem. Um, does someone have another one? Yeah. So. Um, to give uh, ER physicians immediate diagnostic information on patients right when they walk into the ER. Wow. Okay, so that's a good one. Okay, so your customer is who? The customer is the, I guess, the hospital system. The hospital system, the, the purchaser, the procurer at the hospital. Yeah. That's really good because that's super specific. What's their job title? For the, the procurer. I, I guess. This is meant for ER physicians to... Right, but, but who's buying... The ER physicians aren't going to buy it, yeah. so who's, who's going to actually buy it? The hospitals. But do they have a job title? You should always know the job title of the person that you want to buy your product. Even if it's random college student or it's head of procurement for, you know, MedStar Health. Super, super important. And you may learn it, maybe a couple people. 
because you want to create FOMO actually, not just with your end buyer, but with the ER physicians who are like, God, if I had this, it would make my life so much easier. Can you get this for me, right? Okay, so your ecosystem is really cool because it's like a B2B ecosystem. It's not about consumers like his is. You have a very, very focused group. So you need to know your field trade area of practice is clear, right? You want to reach hospital staff and the people who support them and buy the tools that make their lives easier in ERs only? Right now, it's just ERs. Okay. Um, so your audience. Your audience is probably ER doctors, nurses, yeah. and then the staff who buy the supplies that support them. Okay. <clears throat> So now, from a media and a marketing perspective, who are the key players and influencers in these people's lives? Who are they, who are they reading? What conferences are they going to? Do they, get, do they go to a trade website every day? Do they get a newsletter mailed to them? Is there like a hospital equipment weekly that they get? Are they reading medical journals? Yours is more consumer, right? They're going to Craigslist to check out cool stuff. They're asking their friends, I'm having a dinner party and I need someone to come cook for me. It's a much more normal sort of consumer path. Yours is probably a mixture of friends and then people Googling on websites, right? Yeah, it's so the, sorry, I guess the challenge, so we're trying to, we're developing a biotechnology solution for menstrual pain. Um, so it goes in conjunction with a menstrual cup. So brand wise, we're not really fighting against anyone because I guess you're fighting against orally delivered Advil, you know. Right. Um, but I guess the question for the audience and everything, the audience would be any woman, but the advertising really needs to be more on the menstrual cup, just mm -hmm. because it's so much more popular in Europe than here. So I guess how do I, how do you advertise for something that's not yours specifically? Like, <laughs> oh, because you want to build awareness of the menstrual cup and then you supply the medicine to it. So do you need then, okay, so your consumer audience is women who think this is a good idea, but then do you need to actually create deals with the people who make the cups and get no, them so to the adopt? Women could buy it just like they do with Advil, and oh. um, it would kind of be like a sticker. So cup users are really your audience. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. That's actually an easy one because one of the biggest YouTube influencers who I work with a lot is a woman who got her start by doing video blogs about her love of the Diva Cup. <laughs> okay. I watch so many YouTube videos. <laughs> Hannah? Hannah? Hannah. Is she? I think it's Hannah Wilton. So anyway, so, so, so right? So this is yeah. where it's crazy. Like there is a woman who, whose entire like personal brand and content is created and there's more of them around using She Loves the Diva Cup. Mm -hmm. So it's really about getting very specific and thinking of the people who influence the audience that you want to reach. Because if I'm curious and I have been this person like, oh, I should try one of these cups. First, I go on Facebook and I say to my friends, like, do you use one? Then I Google, right? That's sort of your ecosystem, right? Is the path of the user who's asking about, is this a good alternative to tampons, yeah. right? So um, when you think of the key players, I like to think of it both as personal influencers, giant YouTube influencers, people who are really strong in my own social network, media, right? I mean, I think what's interesting for you to think about is you are in a highly regulated industry, right? Um, I have a couple pharmaceutical clients, and when we work, it's very frustrating in social media, right? Because everything needs to be very, very uh, regulated. But for them, they read trade magazines, they go to conferences, they go to trade shows. Every trade show has a blog, right? Every trade show is on Twitter. So you need to think about, okay, who are the six trade shows who these people who buy, who could buy my app, go every year, like interview a bunch of them, and figure out, do they have newsletters, do they have tweet, Twitter handles, like that is literally building out the ecosystem that you are gonna be launching your brand in. Does this make sense? So I guess I should go to these trade shows and then talk to these people on social media? To I would, I would, well, I would start talking, to, I would ask people in hospitals, do some research, both with ER physicians who probably have no time to do anything, and then the people who support them, you know? Are there reps who come? Yeah. So where do the reps go? Pharmaceutical reps have giant social networks. 
So if you're trying to get into that world, you have to figure out where pharmaceutical reps hang out, both online and in trade shows. <laughs> Anyone else want to workshop an ecosystem? So um, our business is still like a pre-product. Um, so our first idea is we want to make like VR, AR glove so that people can feel a touch object in virtual reality. Wow. This is above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can do periods, but I don't know if I can do virtual reality and optic gloves. Okay. So um, our user probably going to be a business which use our VR and AR to um, facilitate other businesses, let's say um, um, for training or for stimulation or mm -hmm. for education. Probably military too, right? Yeah, probably military, yeah. So that's sort of interesting too, right? It's like, what if I'm either... Um, someone who's leading these seminars at the Army War College, for example, where they do a ton of virtual reality, right? They're an early adopter. Or if I'm someone out in Silicon Valley who's a venture capitalist who's investing in this stuff. You sort of need to look for where the early adopters in VR and, and all that stuff are. Figure out what they read, what conferences they're at, who they follow on Twitter. Um, and start building that out. That's your ecosystems, it seems to me, right? Is like, is sort of people in the, in the VR space who are like interested in the next step and who want to apply it in a professional setting, right? Because you're not going to have people just hanging out in their living rooms. You want to apply it in training. That's cool. It's, it's still really like a pre-product. It's very really challenging to develop on. Yeah. I would imagine. Twitter. Start doing some research on Twitter, seriously. One of my favorite hacks is to think about the keywords that are relevant because I have, you know, I have so many clients who are in so many different spaces. Like I may have a client who's advocating for vaccine funding and then I may have a client who's you know, trying to get moms educated about autism and then I may have a political client who wants to mobilize you know, women in Georgia 6 to get out to vote. So I have to get super granular when I'm working on a client and one of the first things that I do is I go to, I go to Twitter and I think about various hashtags or various terms that people might use and I literally search on them because that is such a really helpful way to see who's talking about what online, who has the most followers, what conferences they're at, what events they're at, what media they cite, what reporters cover it, right? Like that's another really cool thing. Who are the five beat reporters who are covering VR? And then also, and this is getting super nerdy, and I only know this because I did a seminar with someone from the, um, the War College a long time ago, you know, who are, the, who are the reporters in the government contracting space? Like there's a, there's, a, there's, an, uh, there's a magazine called Government Technology Executive. They cover all this stuff, right? So who's writing about it? They're surely on Twitter. They're covering other people. It all builds out a network. I just had a question related to like this whole like ecosystem social media presence. Um, where, where in the lifetime of like a young company do you think now. Like, this should, now. like before you, I mean, we do have a product, but I'm just saying like before you have a product, you should start reaching out to people. Nope, you should listen. Media. You should listen. Okay. Because you need to know, right? You need to know what people are excited about. You need to know what reporters are covering. You need to know what people are investing in. It's, it's, it's research, really. I mean, honestly, we, you know, we just did a big research project and I know Jason said surveys are not that great, but um, one of our clients is Cabot Creamery, you know, Cabot Cheese, you guys eat Cabot Cheese. Um, and they are investing a ton of money in volunteerism, and they wanted to figure out what makes people volunteer. And so we, we, just, did, um, we just did a lot of research trying to find people through LinkedIn, through Facebook, bloggers that we knew, people who we knew loved to volunteer. And we could tell it because they talked about it. You know, I mean, again, not rocket science, but really, really important as consumer research that's just there for the taking. And I guess to speak on your point, I saw it. So there's, um, I think it's Instagram that's changed the cycle. Um, and they're simply a site that tells women about options of, you know, medical treatments and procedures that they can go to and go through to help with 
the monthly cycle. And they actually, like, in the Instagram feed, if anyone ever comments on their picture, they immediately ask a question. <laughs> so they're like, um, oh, I'm on my period now. And then change the cycle will pop in and be like, oh, doesn't that suck? Like, what's the worst part? And then we'll automatically say, like, go to our website. This, like, this link will help you. And so I think to speak to her point, you can really start at any time. <coughs> yeah, they don't have a product in like physical sense, but they really are gaining a lot of information from women about what exactly they're experiencing and what they need to know about. But that's kind of creepy because back to our earlier conversation about privacy, that means that they are scanning. They have some sort of software where they are understanding when users are talking about periods, right? I mean, yeah. Right? I don't know, is it public or is it, it I mean, it, it's Instagram, so it can't be too public, right? But they must have, they must be doing some sort of social listening. Or someone's really busy all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's awesome. That's really good community management. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like from what you're saying, it would be worthwhile to <coughs> have your team whose job it is to respond and communicate with as many people as, as okay. possible. So that wouldn't be beyond the idea that they would have like two or three people there to respond to every post, anything somebody said. Well, if you have a consumer product like she does for sure, right? Or if you are offering, um, like, like with your camera, right? You know, if you're offering a product that is high touch and special and you want people to engage on, absolutely. You know, if you, if you are trying to build customer service, you know, think about what Groupon did when they first launched. They had so many reps. It was a really labor intensive model. If you're launching, you know, what you're doing, maybe it's different because it's much more a B2B approach. And so you're using online listening to figure out who the sellers are, who the media is, how you can build a reputation. You know, it's all, again, customized to what you want to do. But it's really important to listen. And then if you feel ready, even if your product's not ready, if you want to dive into the fray and start talking about this stuff, right? Because you don't necessarily have to have a product these days to be a thought leader. <laughs> you, if you know what you're talking about, you can start writing about it and we'll get there in a minute. So I call this your niche. I call your special piece of the ecosystem, the one that only you can fill, is your niche, right? So I want us to all take a minute to identify our niche. I know you all have paper. And you can just think about these questions when you're thinking about it. What do you stand for? Why is your niche important? What do you have to say? Think about the people you read as you're researching your company. Think about the platforms they use. You know, you might be following people on Instagram. Someone else might be following people on LinkedIn, media, etc. If you work in politics, you're following political reporters. Who's in their network? What platforms are they on? And you know, I'll give you an example. And this is from like these are some of the first famous entrepreneurs ever from Brown, the Juice Guys, Tom and Tom. And I was like a sophomore, and I saw them speak, and they were like. What do we do? We're juice guys. We make juice. <laughs> that was their niche. <laughs> and it was amazing, right? They built their whole brand around it because they were really the first. And this was years ago. I don't know if they even, if you guys even still drink it, but this is, you know, before Adwala, before all the juicing, these were two guys who were like, we make really good juice. That's what they did. Um, my niche, you know, I'm a social impact agency. I create campaigns that mobilize women for good. This is my friend Cindy Gallup. She's amazing. She likes to blow shit up. She's the Michael Bay of business. <laughs> um, and, and that's a really fun one, right? Because she's not actually talking about her individual company. She has a couple companies. But she's talking about like what her particular thing in the world is that only she does, which is she blows shit up. And she means that by fighting for change in the advertising industry and all kinds of good stuff. All right, so take a minute. Think about, yes? Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, ugh. these buttons are not very intuitive because when you think you're going back, and you don't have to do it all, but the other, the other questions are helpful to think about when you leave. Are you asking to do it for their personal brand or for their No, venture? for their company. For their venture. For okay. their venture. Just wanted to make sure. Sorry, thank you. Thank you for You can do it for your personal brand if you if you feel better if you want to. There are prob Oh. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> We're running low on time, so I'm actually um, 
Normally I would ask you guys to share out your niche, but I think we're just gonna finish with the stuff and then if we have time after or even at lunch, we can talk through that. Can I take a photo of this slide? Please, and I can send you the slide. I'll share with you one of the, just an anecdote about learning that was really powerful for me. A few years ago, I was working for a client, um, the National Center for Learning Disabilities. They launched a giant new website called understood.org, which is an incredible, incredible site. Um, and they actually use VR on the site to show parents what a day, if you have dyslexia, what that's like. They use VR, so it's amazing. Um, and, and, and one of the things that we learned in talking to moms online was that, um, they were dying for information and community, but they weren't comfortable talking about their kids' LDs, their kids' learning disabilities, you know, in anything that could remotely be construed as a public forum because it's personal and it's their kids' business. Whereas when we interviewed and we talked to parents of kids with severe autism, they felt very open about being public because the culture of talking about autism online is very open or maybe they felt their kids wouldn't mind as much. And so when we were trying to reach parents of children with learning disabilities, we had to actually help people find safe spaces and ways to talk about it and make community online in a way that felt private and safe to them. And so I think that that's also another thing, right? If you're dealing with a topic that people may not be 100% comfortable blasting out on Twitter, some people are, but they want to go to a closed Facebook group because it gives that extra layer, you know, thinking about the venues that people want to have conversations because people want to connect. Okay, so we're just going to dive into some practicalities here. Um, this is own your name, right? And, and I would just say to all of you, I don't know if you do all own domain names around your business. Yeah? Um, you should. <laughs> um, and, and also, you know, think of um, social media handles that you might want to buy. Or, sorry, not buy, but that you might want to sort of reserve. You can go and um, log in and just make sure that you've got them. Even if you aren't going to have, you know, an Instagram platform for two years, if you have a, a name, you might want to go and just log in anyway, get a vanity name on your Facebook group, whatever, on your Facebook page, because um, consistency is important and it's always good to be prepared for the future. That's a small point. Um, the other piece is, is to really own your look. Um, <laughs> this, this is the old, so I have my podcast on Forbes. Um, is called Hiding in the Bathroom. And this is, this is actually pretty old. This was the first graphic that Forbes did, um, which I really loved. I thought it was really adorable and perfect. And then after much iteration, it didn't really work. They wanted a photo of me and a much different brand. Um, but I think the key is to sort of invest and um, if you also want to be taken seriously as a startup founder, you should have some good headshots. In fact, Liz, I don't know if you, you should have someone to take headshots. Because um, even if you're young, right, get, getting your like blurred out, cropped friend that you've taken at a party, you know, photo of, you've taken at a party with a friend where your face is like half cut off because you've cropped it, no. Like get a friend to take a nice photo of you, ask Brown to pay for some headshots, whatever, but I think that um, again, you know, your perception is everything, and when people see your photo online as an entrepreneur, you should look like an entrepreneur. You should look serious. You know, and investing, you know, even if it's, if you have a friend who's a graphic designer, if you want to use something like 99designs, you don't have to spend a lot of money, but I think taking the time to create a look that fits your brand is a really good investment to make. And then you can, you can do it across your platforms, too. So you can put it on your Twitter page. You can make it all consistent. You really create the illusion that you've got an empire, even if you don't. Um, and I just want to show a couple examples. Something I'm a really big fan of, and this is stepping away from your company into a more personal website, but I think it's important as leaders to have both. You'll find nowadays that most prominent, certainly entrepreneurs, 
have their own personal website as well as a company website. This comes back to the whole we are our own portable brand. Um, so I don't know how many of you have optimized your LinkedIn page or might have a simple website that's your own website. How many of you have your own website that's your name? Cool. <laughs> I think, you, I think it's a good investment. It can be very simple. It can be something that you just do on your own. Um, you can do it on Squarespace. You can do it on .me. You can even make your LinkedIn page look really nice. But you should have a hub. You should have a home on the web if you're going to be a leader, um, if you want to be found, <laughs> if you want to start speaking at those conferences. Um, this is a great entrepreneur who I follow, Sarah Rabo Hagen, and she was the CEO of Equinox, you know, the big fitness chain. And so when she um, was CEO of Equinox, she created this really great looking personal page, which of course conveys what? She's in amazing shape, she's super active, she's in New York City, she helps people achieve their goals. And then lo and behold, a few months later, she actually quit corporate and started her own company. And if you look, you can sort of see how her personal brand was laying the groundwork, bless you, for her entrepreneurial venture, right? It's all about actions, all about fitness, about helping people really reach their potential. And so I think that really, really smart entrepreneurs are who they are and have a personal website that reflects all the values of what their company is. And they're sort of related. And that's a valuable thing that you can do easily now just by making your own site on Squarespace or whatever. These are all on Squarespace. But you can see she's done some really cool photography. <laughs> Let's just talk a little bit about content. Um, it sounds like a lot of you guys are doing content creation on Instagram. You're going to make videos. I think that's fantastic. It's a really good way to start. Another thing that you can think about, and this is more about you as an entrepreneur and less about consumer marketing, is by guest blogging, writing in the verticals and publications that matter to the influencers in your life. So if one of your goals is to keep getting invited to accelerators, right, and to keep growing in that sense or to get into the VC community, can you start, you know, doing a guest blog on websites for young entrepreneurs? Can you write really smart things on medium.com? Do any of you guys write on medium? Sort of a group platform you do, yeah, cool. You guys can start, you can write, you should all write an article for their medium. Write something smart, show off. Right? <laughs> totally. Put your new headshot on there. Um, but <laughs> one of the most powerful ways to cultivate credibility is to submit a freelance article, to submit a blog to a respective publication. And it is really not that hard, right? And you've got a great way to start right here. So that's a challenge I have to you. This is Education Week. You know, I do a lot of work in the education reform and ed tech community. and. Um, there are a lot of, and this is Ed Week, which is the biggest trade publication in the education space, and they have a lot of teachers, entrepreneurs who contribute blogs, and it's a fantastic, it's free content for Ed Week, but it's also wonderful credibility for people who are trying to make a name for themselves in the education speak, space. Um, this is a really fun example, and I throw this out for people who are feeling ambitious and like they really want to dive into social media. Um, this is a friend of mine, Susan McPherson, who is the god of CS, goddess of CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. That's her business. So a while back, about six years ago, she loves Twitter. She started a weekly Twitter chat. It's probably bi-weekly called hashtag CSR chat, Corporate Social Responsibility chat. And this is a franchise because what she does is she creates these conversations on Twitter using this hashtag and it gives her an excuse to call up the biggest leaders in her field and say, hey, you want to come on Twitter for an hour and talk about the great work you're doing? Of course they do, right? So she's got this incredible audience. She's got this great franchise on Twitter and it's built in visibility and business development. I love this example. So that's something fun to think about when you are thinking about how am I going to reach people on social media? Am I going to create recipes on Instagram for my cooks? Am I going to show off the best photographs of the people you know, who've bought my product? How can you actually reward the people who follow you, make it fun, and pay dividends to yourself in terms of branding? Um, Trade Press 2.0. We talked about this. This is an example from Medium. Um, this is absolutely crazy to me. I was doing some searching 
um, when I was preparing for this and I, and I Googled like, smartest voices on Medium, or best articles for entrepreneurs on Medium. You know, Medium is this sort of open source group blog where anyone can write. And this guy, who's just like a random entrepreneur, has gotten the top result for smartest articles um, on Medium. And then he's, he advertises his business, which is basically content marketing. Well, that's really smart. He writes about the smartest stuff on Medium, and you go to his blog, and lo and behold, he wants to help you write smart things on Medium. So again, you know, it's about using cheap tools, sharing your expertise, and getting traffic. Um, this is a really, this is my, my really good friend, Jane, Jane Mosbacher Morris, who um, owns a social enterprise called To the Market. They sell Survivor made goods, and she does a really, really beautiful job. Again, has a very visual product, really beautiful product. It's sourced from all over the world. And her whole message is using your supply chain to make good. So she does a great job of creating beautiful and fun things on Instagram. And she's also got hashtag supply chain in there, right? Because she wants to get a corporate audience of people who are actually looking for supply chain news, and also her followers who love to see her getting the products. So you can be super creative. Some of the best political campaigns that we've done on really serious issues have used great photos on Instagram. OK, last slides. Um, <clears throat> we've talked a lot <clears throat> excuse me, about your ecosystem, who's around, where people hang out. This is all about networks. I think that networks are really, really important. Obviously, I'm not the only one. I'm just a little one. But you should think in a networked way every day of your life. You're here because you're already part of a great network, right? You will be part of many more great networks. You will meet people offline. You will friend them online. You will have a seamless sort of online-offline integration in your professional life. And 20 years from now, those will be the people who give $10 million to your next company, right? So, Starting today, if you haven't been already, and I'm sure you have because you're all here, think about all your relationships, online, offline, professional, personal, as part of one big network, right? And treat it well, be, be a good citizen, be kind, you know, all that, all that stuff your mom taught you. Um, but I, I can't emphasize enough how, as an entrepreneur and in this digital age, it's just about your networks, right? It just really is. And then my last word is on conference culture. This is something that's um, a little bit controversial, but I wanted to mention it because I have a feeling that as entrepreneurs, as you go, conferences will become a big part of your life. Are, is anyone already starting to go to conferences, tech conferences, startup conferences, right? Um, I think about conferences. I mean, to me as an introvert, I don't really like them. But they are a fantastic way to meet new people, to expand your network, to get industry knowledge, and um, a huge part also of building your personal brand these days and your online professional brand because conferences are so focused on having a hashtag and being out there and creating content and filming you for YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. So as you're thinking about all building all your online content, I also want you to be thinking about the conferences in your space where you need to be, right? And this could be the trade show for procurement officers in large hospital systems. It could be a camera enthusiast trade show. You know, it, it can be whatever is specific. Food, I mean, there's so many specialty food events, right? Gosh, the specialty food world is overwhelming. But think about that. And don't just think about it as a place you need to go, but think about it as a way to build your, your online network as well. Um, any other questions? How are we doing on time? Good? Okay, I'm, oh, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I guess just like a, a question about um, getting a, an article or something uh, like re-syndicated on a larger blog or platform. Um, so would you just like publish that on Medium and then um, like either have those people like in your network or do you think it's more valuable to like send, like, so say, I don't know, you want something on, like, Huffington Post, like, send it into Huffington Post and be like, I wrote this thing, or, like, network with someone beforehand and then be like, yo, like, 
check out. If you can network with someone beforehand, always do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's sort of like having a job, like applying online versus knowing someone. Yeah. But I mean, you bring up a good point, and, and this is something also which I think is important, which is that you can't be afraid to brag these days like and show off. So if you write something on Medium that you really like, hopefully you already have channels that you can promote. Because these days, remember the example of people don't go to websites anymore? You know, if you write something on a blog, no one's going to see it unless you promote it. So you need to think about, unless it's on a well-trafficked site, that is the sort of smart thing about being on a site that already has a lot of traffic. It does the work for you. But if you write something on your Medium page where you don't have many followers, you then blast it out on Facebook, you blast it out on Twitter, you say, check out this article, I'd really love your thoughts. We didn't talk about newsletters, but I still think that email newsletters are so, so valuable. One thing that you can also think about doing is creating your, online, uh, your own database. Everyone you meet, every customer, opt them into a MailChimp database, send newsletters. Um, so, so valuable. Even though we all say we live on social media, I think that email, especially in business, is the number one way to reach people. So. Um, I have I have Mailchimp. I've had it for many years. I just you know I'm always constantly adding people to various lists and sending them newsletters, articles. You know, even sending out an email. I mean, I have friends who who write an article and then send it out to 80 of their best friends through Gmail and be like, I wrote this. I'd really love a share. You know, again, it comes back to being a good part of a network. If I share your article, you're happy to share my article, right? It's about reciprocity. I uh, wrote an article once about um, for a class with Ray McKesson, who's a big um, uh, advocate for like, race and ethnicity um, studies. And he, I added it. I added him on Twitter, yep. and then he shared my article. And was, I no one reads my articles, but he read it and he shared it with all. Right, because you you added him, added yeah. him, Twitter, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, hey, Ray McKesson. Yeah. And we probably use a hashtag too, right? Yeah. Hashtags are really important because that's how people search. Yeah. And he was psyched because you wrote something nice yeah. about him. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. So, how is there a, a resource we can use to analyze which of the social media channels we should use for our own? Yes, so, there's like, a bunch. Okay. What, well, what do you do? So, um, we build vertical farming technology, and so we're selling to small farmers. That's interesting. So I mean, there's and there's there's the double challenge, right? Because everyone in their daily life uses the same social networks we all do, right? <laughs> they're on Facebook, they're on Snapchat, they're on Instagram. So there's that, and then there's the networks that they use for their business, and they probably do a lot of emails. I mean, email newsletters, right? And magazines even. Um, and so one of the things, I mean, with farming, it's hard. If you're doing broad-based industry research, you can go to Quantcast, you can look up just you know Nielsen eMarketer and find broad-based. If you're getting super niche like that, um, I think you have to put a little shoe leather into it. Again, Twitter hashtag searching, just searching for blogs, email newsletters, industry events. There's probably listservs also, I would assume. Right? Yeah. Um, this is, I mean, listservs are really, really huge when you think about networks. And this takes actually being in your space a little bit more. Um, but for example, you know, every, every industry and every group of influentials will have their own listserv. Mm -hmm. And you need to figure out what that is. And that's just going places and listening. Thanks. I wonder if um, we were just talking about bottom up research before you came in this morning. I wonder, are there? And usually companies are always trying to hawk their, their products uh, through the various social media channels. Is there a way to use them effectively to get research done about sort of whether it's mark, not even just market research, but just connect with prospective customers to learn about their unmet needs? And yeah. So what, what, would that, what would that look like? Well, I mean, I, I think you brought up a great example. Um, you know, you'll see now a lot of people using Twitter as customer service which is sort of passive research. Mostly they get yelled at. Um, but I think that brands, really smart brands now, are using, I think especially Twitter because it's public, um, to ask people what they think about a new phone release or a new X, Y, and Z. Brands are getting more, more bold, really, about asking people. Most really smart brands will have an influencer community, and this is really my business, you know. So, Condé Nast magazines, or um, 
you know, every fashion brand or sneaker brand or Apple GoPro, they will have a database of their best customers or their biggest social media influencers who they give VIP treatment and they will do focus groups and they will invite them to the factory. You know, Procter & Gamble invites mom bloggers to see its new products. Disney spends tons of money investing in listening to moms. It's a huge... I would, I would really early stage venture. I mean, well, you, that's where you have to hack it. I mean, you have to do your Twitter searching and you have to listen to what people are saying. I think by doing a lot of searching. And, and, and also the other thing is that you can do focus groups. I, I, people love to give their opinion. So if you have prototype customers or if you have friends, like ask them. Throw out an open thread on Facebook, like just ask people. Okay. With people in your network that are you know, very social and very popular on those social media sites, are they able to still keep their more private accounts or just like their, you know, the, the stupid family pictures, not stupid, but like the fun family pictures and yeah. stuff like that for the smaller, just because like, Yeah, like I they'll do like a friends only, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll do a friends only Facebook post or, you know, they might have different Instagrams, you know. Okay, so you are able to keep your like private sector even though you're on the... Yeah. So when you're on like a lot of uh, social media channels and hypothetically you're getting a lot of like incoming data, do you think it's worth investing into like developing analytics and like filtering out what's more important to you know to respond to or like um, using other companies proprietary solutions it's all about money and volume I mean if you have the money sure <laughs> um, absolutely all you really need is Google Analytics and then you know some sort of hashtag tracker or, yeah. I mean again it's about volume if you're getting millions and millions of impressions you might want to invest in something if, if you're not and you have the time yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a simple person. I, I don't, you know, I have software that we have to use for my clients. Um, but, you know, I think, I think honestly, you know, Google Analytics and then some sort of social media tracking is, is what you need. Anything else? I think I'm going to suggest that we take a break. That was wonderful. So let's